Thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, uh, but I look forward to hearing what others have to say. Okay, so uh, we've heard the viewpoints from uh, climate science and uh, from economics. What I wanted to do in mine is um, give you a perspective from political philosophy and uh, answer the question, you know, what is a just response to uh, climate change, but more generally the ecological crisis? So it has relevance for all planetary boundaries and it's very relevant for biodiversity. So I think there are two kind of guiding principles that should inform how we think about uh, challenges like climate change. Uh, one is, what kind of world is it that we should leave uh, for current and future generations? And uh, I have put on the PowerPoint uh, under paragraph two, um, uh, this, this kind of principle, I'm not going to say very much about it. So uh, I just didn't want to bite off more than I could uh, chew. My own view is something like the world we should bequeath to future generations should be guided by a principle of equality plus, by which I mean we should um, not claim more for ourselves than we can leave future generations. We should leave them at least as well off as us, but in some conditions and some circumstances, we have a duty to leave them better off. But I'm not um, gonna say uh, anything more about that. I just wanted to underscore, we need some principle of this nature. What I am gonna say something about is um, the following. So suppose someone says, right, well, we now have some idea of what we owe future generations. But getting from here to there, there are lots of policy um, choices on the table. And I've listed some of them here. We could have you know, cap and trade, we could have carbon taxes, we can have investment in clean technology, we can have electrification, renewables. Uh, more radically, some people will say we should have degrowth. Um, Many philosophers uh, argue that we should curb world population, and then there are forms of geoengineering. And so we're assaulted in a way with lots of proposals for what should be done. And often these rely on competing empirical understandings of what would be most effective. But there's also value judgments at stake because most of the policies, um, perhaps all of them will raise questions of ethics or justice. And so, yeah, for example, a trading scheme will raise questions uh, about whether it's regressive in its effect or progressive. Uh, a carbon tax may similarly um, perhaps result in fuel poverty. Uh, renewables often require things like cobalt, lithium, copper, and these are often extracted in very harmful ways that are deleterious to local communities. In the UK, there was a scheme of, of feed-in tariffs um, but that was socially regressive. It turned out that more affluent uh, people could afford to put a wind turbine on their house and they were subsidized by less affluent consumers. And clearly, if people mention population limits, um, there are ethical issues. So the main starting point I want to convey is that um, transitions to um, a sustainable world will raise lots of questions of justice and ethics. And then we need to ask ourselves quest the question, what values should guide us here? And in my time allotted, I'm going to put forward uh, five values that I think should, should guide us. Some of these will be controversial and there won't be enough time to try and defend them. Some of them may be uh, less contentious. I'm going to begin with one that I think is least contentious. So value uh, number one would be um, responsibility. There's a very powerful idea of justice that if an agent A pollutes, then other things being equal, A should pay for that. You know, so many people subscribe to uh, the polluter pays principle. And I think underlying this is an idea of, in, of agent responsibility, that agents can be held responsible for their actions. And so yeah, if outside my house I, I make a, a mess, then I should clear it up. That's the, the, the intuition in, articulated by many political philosophers, like Henry Hsu, but I think it's a very common sense idea. And if we take this principle seriously, 
Then it would say other things being equal, a just transition would say that agents should pay in proportion to their contribution. So if we're looking at the financial costs of investing in clean technology or the financial costs of urban restructuring to reduce ecological footprint or the financial costs in investing to create green, uh, green jobs, then this first principle would say, well, among other things, uh, the costs should be borne in proportion to uh, agents' uh, emissions. And if I were there in person, I would take an opinion poll, but I would be surprised if people thought this had no role to play. I'm going to um, take that as a starting point. Um, but I think it's actually less straightforward than I've made it seem so far, because normally we hold agents responsible but only under certain conditions. Um, the extent to which we hold agents responsible will depend on their set of opportunities, and in particular, whether they've got a, a fair share of resources and opportunities. So if we compare, for example, a poor person who can develop only through the use of fossil fuels, and an affluent person who has other sources of energy available, but just chooses to use fossil fuels, then I think it would be a serious mistake just to look at the emissions that each emits and treat them identically, irrespective of the alternatives available and irrespective of whether the emissions are used for necessities or frivolous pursuits. So I think most people would say we should not treat um, these emissions the same because the agents are facing different circumstances. And so the underlying idea then is, um, I think the, the extent to which we can hold agents responsible for their emissions will depend in part on whether they have a fair share of resources and opportunities. And so therefore we need an account of what their fair share of resources and opportunities would be. This takes us to the second value I'm gonna put on the table. So I'm hoping that you'll, you'll subscribe to some version of the idea that the polluter should pay but that it's not the only relevant principle. And I think a second relevant principle would be equality, um, because I think each individual uh, has a, a right to an equal standard of living. Uh, people should not be penalised um, because of the country they're born in or the class they're born into or the racial category or their gender. Uh, any kind of... Uh, system of distribution that does this, I think, is discriminating in an arbitrary way. And, and for those who are familiar with uh, the recent literature and political philosophy, um, this is what Mark Fleurbe is, I think, called a, uh, a, a responsibility-sensitive egalitarianism, or others have called luck egalitarianism. And so the thought then is, if we look at that example I gave a minute ago, if you compare the poor person needing fossil fuels to survive and the rich person who doesn't need the fossil fuels but just chooses to use that, uh, we should, on my view then, not hold the poor person responsible for their emissions. They shouldn't be charged because they're entitled to meet their needs. They're entitled to achieve a decent standard of living, which on my view would be an equal standard of living. Suppose you're unpersuaded by the egalitarian view, you might have a sufficientarian view and say that everyone should be above a decent minimum and you'd still hold then that the poor person should not be made to pay for the emissions they need because they are entitled to a decent standard of living. And so then the practical implications of this, and I keep wanting to flip between the theory, the principle and the practice would be this, that the transition to a zero carbon world should not impose burdens on the least advantaged um, because the least advantaged are entitled to a better standard of living than they currently enjoy. They're either entitled to a decent minimum or to an equal standard of living, but on either account, it's unfair to make the just transition be borne by the least advantaged. And so if there is a carbon tax on fuel and it does contribute to fuel poverty, then there's a duty on the part of the state to compensate the disadvantaged. If renewables or clean technology or energy efficiency initiatives cost money, then these should not be borne by the poorest. Uh, if um, mitigation leads to some industries um, having to uh, close down or people lose jobs, then you can see the corollary again, 
that the least disadvantaged, sorry, the most disadvantaged should be shielded from the harsh impacts. And this applies for lots of other things. So think about renewables. Uh, I, I like renewables. I think we should be transitioning to renewables, but the current system for extracting renewables does inflict harm on some of the world's most vulnerable people. And from this egalitarian viewpoint, that would be unacceptable. So there should be processes of extraction and remuneration that don't mean that rich countries can get to zero carbon by harming poorer countries um, because of the ways in which they extract cobalt, copper, lithium, rare earth elements, and so on. Okay, so um, as I said, you may not agree with an egalitarian viewpoint, but even if you agree with a, a more modest view that says everyone is entitled to a sufficient standard of living, that should inform your view about the just transition. So, so far then, I think we have two values on the table. We have that any cost should be borne in part according to who is responsible for causing the problem, um, but this should be sensitive to people's uh, economic rights, and that includes a right to an equal standard of living. But I think we need to go further than this, and I want us to just go back to the idea of responsibility. So I think the underlying idea of the polluter pays principle is we hold people responsible for their choices. If I choose to take a plane flight, then um, I should pay any uh, ecological cost that that incurs if I indeed, indeed take that flight. Perhaps I shouldn't take that flight. But um, I think lots of people approach this in an unduly individualistic way. And they assume we have much more agency over the magnitude of our ecological footprint than is in fact the case. Many of the determinants of our ecological footprint are structural in nature. So here are five uh, kind of uh, illustrations of that point. Take urban design. And suppose we have a couple and suppose they have uh, a couple of children and that they both work. Their ecological footprint is going to be determined on by whether there are schools nearby residential areas. It's going to be determined by whether their place of employment is near where they live and where their children go. It's going to be determined by whether there are uh, shops or other sources of provisioning that are easy within reach. And the more dispersed a city is, the higher the ecological footprint, the more dense it is, uh, the lower. And this is something individuals have no choice over. Uh, they can perhaps choose which city to live in, but if all cities are um, sort of not at all densely populated, they're like Atlanta and Georgia with everything being spread out, then they're going to have a high ecological footprint, and there's very little they could do about that. A second thing they could do very little about is whether there's public transit or not, and the energy system used by public transit. So it'd be unfair to hold someone responsible for their emissions if they've got really no choice but to drive a lot and there's no public transit. And then the third thing that's often beyond people's control is uh, building regulations. There are ways of designing buildings now which reduce the ecological footprint by up to 90% and in some cases 100%. But I as an individual consumer can't magic that into action. It depends on whether there are government regulations. Similarly, waste disposal, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe social norms is a slightly more contentious one, but some people would say people's emissions often strongly are determined or at least profoundly influenced by prevailing social norms. For example, wearing a business suit. Uh, if people have to wear a business suit, then they will ask that their office is air conditioned. If their office is air conditioned, emissions will go up. I think it's somewhat unfair to hold the individual responsible if their working environment demands that they wear a suit. That example, I should say, comes from Elizabeth Shove. And then people's ecological footprint will be a function of the uh, technology available to them. Um, and uh, to use terms uh, coined by Ronald Walkin, uh, you know, if they're in a fossil fuel dependent economy, then their ecological footprint will reflect those circumstances more than their choice. So uh, the key point I'm trying to make here is that there are structural limits to individual responsibility. And 
Um, that means it's unfair to hold individuals responsible for their high emissions in some circumstances, but we should hold collectives responsible, structures responsible. So if a city designs, you know, city council designs it in, in ways that compel its citizens to travel long distances, then that unit um, should be held responsible. But then for that unit to be held responsible, I think there has to be democratic decision-making over urban design, for example, energy systems. Only in that way is it fair to hold the individual members of that collective responsibility. And this links to ideas of energy democracy that some people put forward, which is they want to take the idea of responsibility seriously, but then they say, look, but the relevant unit is not the individual. The relevant unit might be the city level or the federal unit of a state or, or some other demarcation. And where that's the case, we need democratic decision-making about the structural determinants of our ecological footprint. So if you agree with that, we've now got a, a third value. We've got, we've got responsibility, equality, and democracy. Um, uh, there's, there's another value that, that um, I would add. So I'm just uh, flipping forward, which um, is liberty. So you can have systems um, which might treat people's responsibility seriously and respect equality, but are incredibly prescriptive. So, for example, the philosopher Sarah Connolly says that each couple may have one child, but no more than one child. Christine Overall has said a couple may have two children, but no more than two children. Now, I, I think there's something problematic about this because the determinants of ecological sustainability are multi-causal. They are dependent on people's level of consumption, the technologies available, the number of people, but very, very many factors. And given this, I think it sits ill with that science and that understanding to single out one factor, which is population, and say, we're going to issue a prescription um, that governs that one factor in isolation and say, no, no matter what else a society does, um, it must constrain its population, even if it's transitioned to zero uh, carbon technology. So it seems to me that's inimical to the value of freedom there. And what we should do is say, look, societies and individuals should live within their ecological limits, but they can choose how to do that. So they can have a, uh, an ecological budget, so to speak, but they should have the choice then as to how they spend it. So that's why I would add the fourth value, which is liberty, that um, it's not enough to have equality, democracy and responsibility, but we should tell citizens, you have a duty to live within your ecological limits, but you can um, choose how you do so within those limits. And then uh, this leaves one final value, which maybe is more contentious. Uh, again, I would love to take an opinion poll, but someone might say, uh, but look, Simon, you've left out one crucial ingredient, which is all of these values are very human-centered, but what about non-anthropocentric values? So what about um, the value of the natural world in and of itself, and what about the impact on non-human animals? And, and I agree with this. I think mitigation policies and adaptation policies should be informed by duties to non-human animals and um, duties to the natural world. And I'm going to give you an intuition pump that uh, I hope will kind of motivate that thought for you. So consider this island called Henderson Island, which is in the South Pacific Ocean. I think it's quite a long way from any other inhabited island. So its impact on uh, human beings, I think, is quite slight. But suppose it exists. But let's... Um, Let's just bracket that out for a moment. On Henderson Island, there are, as you hopefully can see on the PowerPoint, over 37 million bits of plastic littering the surface. The, these are, you know, fizzy drink bottles or footballs, plastic uh, items of all different kinds that people have thrown away and they've washed up on the island. And these have impacts on animal species, as you can see, and often uh, birds get asphyxiated because they have the plastic around their neck or, or I think sea life uh, swallows it and it destroys its internal digestion system. 
Now, when I give this example to most people, most people think this is really objectionable. This is wrong. And it's wrong in and of itself. We shouldn't treat the planet like a dustbin. It's wrong because it harms uh, non-human animals. And even if it does harm human beings, that doesn't fully explain people's intuition that this is an objectionable thing to do. And if you find this persuasive, as I do, then you would add a fifth value into the mix. Okay, so let me um, come, come to a conclusion then. And if someone says to me, well, uh, what's a just response to the ecological crisis, like climate change, but more generally, I'm going to give two types of answers. I'm going to say, look, humanity must live within certain limits, so we bequeath a decent planet to future generations. Criterion one, which I mentioned at the start. But secondly, any transition from here to there has to be done in a fair and ethical way. And what that means then is that the burdens incurred should be borne in part by looking at the responsibility principle. Who is, who's responsible for this? It's predominantly the wealthy and their high emissions. But secondly, I'm going to say we shouldn't just look at people's responsibility in terms of their causation of emissions, um, we have to take into account people's socioeconomic entitlements. And in my view, that means their entitlements to an equal standard of living. But then I said, third, we can't just leave it at that because that's unduly individualistic. Many of the determinants of our ecological footprint are actually structural in nature. And therefore, we need to hold collectives re responsible. And that means democratizing the collectives. So we need democracy, we need energy democracy, sustainability democracy. And then the fourth thing I said was, um, the account so far omits an important value, which is liberty. People should live sustainably, but they can have a choice as to how they discharge that duty. And then the fifth thing was the one I just mentioned, which is, we should, I think, go beyond a purely anthropocentric perspective. And maybe this will link in with the discussions in the afternoon in particular, but we might recognize the intrinsic value of ecosystems and the importance of duties to our fellow creatures on the planet. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. And I, I do apologize for all the uh, technical hitches. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you all the three speakers for your fascinating and thought-provoking presentations. So now we have the discussion section. So who would like to start? And for those of you present, I hope you don't mind just giving your name and affiliation before you raise your question. And you'll have a mic that will be passed around. Ah, so Kian, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kian Minsu. Um, I'm a lecturer at University College Cork. So I had a question for Simon on that last uh, presentation about uh, equality. I think it was the second um, principle you brought up. So you said that it was important that we uh, address the impacts on people who might be negatively affected by these policies. And I was curious what the scope of that was. So we might think that it's national, in which case it was what you were suggesting, which is maybe people who are negatively affected by um, policies, they, they, should be, they should get recompense. But if we're thinking at a very larger global scale, then those flows of money might you want to go to somewhere very different, maybe the very poorest of the world, who already, of course, we know are impacted from climate change disproportionately from, say, here in Paris or, or some other wealthy, rich, industrialized country. So I'm wondering if you think that there's a tension between thinking of um, the scope, either nationally or internationally, because I think the policy implications would be quite different, and it seemed to be possible we could read that equality principle both ways. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Should, should I answer? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a very good question. And I mean, I'm a global egalitarian. So I think the principle of equality should apply across the world. And then on this view, it's just uh, unfair that someone born in Bihar in North India has worse prospects for a decent standard of living than someone born in the United Kingdom or in, in Paris. Now, that is quite a controversial view. I, I have a book defending it, but I'm not going to try and persuade you here now. I would say two quick things. So one is the underlying intuition is the reason I think many people are egalitarian. 
would mean, on my view, it's incoherent to apply it within one country. So in the UK, people often complain about what they call a postcode lottery. They think it's really unfair that someone born in one uh, county has worse standard of living than someone born in another county. And it's quite a big issue. And I think that is true, but we have a global postcode lottery and pen people are being penalized through no fault of their own because of where they're born. However, there are lots of people um, who follow the ideas of John Rawls who object to this, and they give some arguments which explain why the country is special or the state is special, such that equality only applies at home. I, I can't go into all of those here, uh, but I, I don't find this persuasive. But the second thing I want to say is uh, I appeal to a sufficiency principle, and I do think it's much less controversial to say that that should apply globally. And so if people have, let's say, take biofuels, and there was a great push on biofuels in the first decade of this uh, century, um, I think it led to spikes in food, uh, food prices in many developing countries. I think we have a duty you know, not to act in ways that push people beneath a decent standard of living there. Or take renewables. Um, I think this is going to be discussed this afternoon, but uh, renewables often have very harmful uh, effects or the extractive process on poor people in other countries. And I think uh, we have a duty not to cause those harms. So if someone balks at the egalitarianism, then I have this fallback uh, principle that I think more people are willing to sign up to. Great if you're egalitarian, though. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a related question uh, to Simon. Um, I was wondering how would you operate this, um, this responsibility principle in an intertemporal inter way? Um, do you consider that states are responsible or do you um, consider that today's individuals are responsible, are responsible for the emissions of their ancestors? Um, some individuals have in, in her inherited wealth um, that was derived from the use of the atmosphere in the past. So should they pay it back? And what are your, your views on this? Thank you. Thank you. That's... A terrific question. In fact, I think that there's at least two terrific questions in there, both of which I won't be able to do justice to. So I think you mentioned, is it the role of individuals or is it the state? Uh, and I do think a corollary of some of the things I said about the structural determinants is that the appropriate level for many of these is at the uh, the political level, the state level. Um, and it's just because I think it's unfair to... Uh, hold many individuals responsible for their emissions when they really don't have much choice to do otherwise. But I think maybe what you were driving at was the other thing which you mentioned, which was the intergenerational aspect, and in particular the, the past. And can I just double check? So are you asking, uh, you know, should contemporary citizens bear the ecological debt of their predecessors? Is, is that... I don't know if we can just quickly flick to the questioner. I just want to make sure I'm answering the right question. But was that the question? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is a deep and thorny question. And I'll give you my answer in a rather bold, dogmatic way, um, which is I'm an individualist on these in one sense. In that I, or rather, I, I don't think it's fair to hold individuals or indeed groups responsible for things that were beyond their control. And... So if you look at a contemporary British citizen, I don't think they should uh, be held responsible for the emissions of their predecessors in the 19th century as the Industrial Revolution kicked off. And the reasoning is, is this, you know, if you take an individualistic approach, then you hold an agent responsible for their emissions. So I should pay for my emissions if I drive a polluting car. Uh, the corollary of my other argument was, well, maybe my city should um, be responsible for the emissions it currently perpetuates. But I do think it would be unfair to make uh, current citizens or current members of that city pay for debts that others have incurred. Now, some people have a contrasting view, and what they would say is, no, the relevant unit is something like a nation or a state, and it persists through time. 
And so the unit at T1 is Britain, and Britain polluted and Britain should pay. But I just worry about the implications that has. So if you take contemporary South Africans and we think about debt taken out under the apartheid regime, we're not going to say that contemporary South Africans should pay back the debts that some other people took out um, 30, 40, uh, 50 years ago. So um, I think we should hold agents, individual and collective responsible for their emissions, but not for ones that others have emitted. But can I just add one other thing? Because um, then someone might say, look, but there are other principles that apply here. Like we have benefited from those past emissions and maybe uh, current members of the United Kingdom should uh, contribute even for emissions they didn't cause, but because they have benefited from, let's say, the infrastructure, the technology. And I don't ultimately agree with that, but I think that's a more plausible way than the collective responsibility view. Uh, I should stop talking. I could talk for a long time about this, but I, I hope you get to, that gives you a gist of how I'm reaching my view, which goes against the ways that many people think. Many people want to say, oh, look, uh, these affluent countries cause the problem that affluent countries should pay. And I'm, I'm worried about that kind of line of reasoning. Yes. Um I would like to uh, gather the three speakers uh, in this question. Um, so we heard uh, Jean Pascal show that uh, human beings are clearly responsible for what's going on in terms of climate change and increase in concentration of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, but Helene has shown that there are so many spillovers between economic agents um, that sorting out the effects of regulation, but I guess also the effect of uh, changes in behaviors, right? Could because of all these uh, potential economic spillovers, uh, may be difficult to do. And so I wonder if the principles of fair share or the principles of responsibility uh, can be um, easily applied in a context in which there are strong impacts, but it's it may be difficult to analyze the details of what happens in, in terms of economic actions and the impact of uh, of regulation. So, who would like to start answering this? Uh, Jean Pascal, yeah, maybe? I, I, I Could we please have the mic? Thank you. Well, certainly not a full answer, but an element of answer is that the science of um, attribution of extreme events to climate change uh, has made huge progress and it's also one I didn't mention that in, in, in my speech I, I didn't have the time but it's one of the areas where a lot of progress has been made so for example um, two weeks after the IPCC report uh, the, the uh, uh, preliminary study it's of course not peer-reviewed but still it's a scientific report written by a dozen uh, institutions attributed the floods uh, and I mean, the in, at least the intense rain in Belgium and Germany mid-July uh, to uh, um, uh, global warming. And, and that's increasingly the case, uh, and it's increasingly used in litigation, in trials, uh, against sometimes either a country or a company. But it's not the full answer to your question, but it's an element of answer. Thank you for the question. I think from my perspective, the main point that I wanted to uh, put forward is that we really need a cap over all potential sources. And those policies are not designed in that way. They are always leaving some you know, firms or plants out of their design. This is done mostly for efficiency because they think they, can, they cannot really supervise so many units. But I think that if we are really if we really want to be consistent, we, we need to consider everything. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> so, if I may raise a question to Jean Pascal, maybe in particular. Uh, I think I saw you somewhere citing John Holdren, that climate action has three components, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And I'm wondering, given what you showed us from the last IPCC assessment report, um, how we should think about that. And I'm thinking about the, uh, another climatologist, Michael Mann, and his criticism of doomsday theory and that he could disincentivize individuals to take action to combat climate change. 
Do you have any, could you, would you like to respond to this? Uh, because, I mean, you've shown us these rather pessimistic graphs, you know, that the current mitigation level is not enough. And um, how should we think yeah. about that? In terms of incentivizing it, you're all responsible according to the principles that five and exposed. And well, um, I, I, I basically agree with both uh, John Holdren and Michael Mann, uh, whom I know well of them. Uh, so what, what Holdren said is that there will be facing climate change mitigation aspects, adaptation aspects, there will be a mix of the three and, and the choice and, and, and the weight on each of the three aspects uh, is ours. I mean we can decide to do very little mitigation and that is what apparently humanity has decided up to now, collectively, on average let's say, and that means that attempts will be made to adapt um, if possible to uh, the effects of climate change and that will not be possible fully, that's very clear. Adaptation has its limits and also its costs, including human costs and ecosystem costs and therefore <coughs> the, the remaining option will be more developed, suffering. I mean, but it's a choice. I mean we can choose to do more adaptation, which will certainly help, but for that you need money. I mean, that's one of the uh, asks of developing countries in the, in the climate negotiations, and I'm sure it will be again repeated at COP26 in, in two weeks from now. Uh, and or we can decide to do more mitigation, in which case less adaptation in the future, because there's a, a time lag, uh, will be needed. and of course, less suffering will take place. I mean, it's a choice, and, and it's a question of what's the weight you put, where, when, who does it, and of course, uh, what <laughs> Simon explained is very interesting to think about who must do what, um, but, I but it's a choice. I mean, we, we have the choice, uh, we still have the choice uh, of not only suffer. But I also agree with Michael Mann that um, to um, uh, to, um, uh, to 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 to, sim to simply depict, uh, but in a sense that's what I've been asked uh, today because I wasn't I wasn't asked to speak about the part of the report which is not there yet and which will only be there in uh, February and March, uh, and which deals with solutions. But usually, when I give a general talk, I don't only talk about the working group one and the doom and gloom uh, scenarios that. Uh, uh, it's assessing. I also uh, try to explain that there are uh, many uh, possible solutions. So the only thing I kept from that is my statement that we still had the choice. Um. Thank you. So before we close this session, I'd like to ask the students who are participating if you have a question you'd like to raise in relation to these three presentations. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, I thought uh, there was another question. Um, it would be maybe on the IPCC report. Um, in fact, it will probably play a role in the COP26 uh, in Glasgow. But, um, I mean, there is nothing very new in the report. So what could be the role of the sixth, the sixth report um, in two weeks? in Glasgow. What do you think it could change, in fact, in the decision process? Thank you. Well, alone, the IPCC report is not going to change much, of course. I mean, it's one element. I mean, it's, as I tried to explain, it's, it's clearer information, repeating what once more, with more details, with more evidence, uh, what we knew already 30, if not 40 years ago. Uh, but S knowledge clearly is not enough <laughs> to to uh, produce action. Many other elements uh, are needed to transform uh, that knowledge into action. But I hope it will be 
um, if not welcome, because the previous uh, reports from the IPCC were not even welcome uh, by the uh, COP in Madrid. There was a, a long fight about the word to use, whether we took note of, which is not so nice, or we welcome, which was not decided. Uh, the report of the IPCC, probably the same kind of discussion will take place. Now, that's not the most important, what, of course, is much more important is what, what is done on that basis, but the information cannot be clearer.